Big Tin Can is the world's leading sales learning and enablement platform that delivers the onboarding and training, preparation, coaching, customer engagement, and follow-up and insights that modern businesses need to win. Welcome to the Sales Influence Podcast, where we talk about finding the why in how people buy. I'm your host, Victor Antonio. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for lending me those ears. If you're watching this on video, I appreciate your eyeballs. Today, I have BT himself, the BT Express, Barry Trailer. Barry, how you doing this morning? After that, Victor, I am, I am on fire, Victor. Let's do this, Barry. Let's do this. Barry, let these folks know at the Sales Influence Podcast who you are. Yeah, I think uh, Jim and, and I, Jim Dickey, my partner, and I are maybe, you know, one of the best kept secrets around, uh, you know, B2B sales. I'm not sure why that is. We've been together for 20 years now, started CSO Insights, you know, research and advisory services coming back in 2002, so literally 20 years ago. And uh, that got acquired by the Miller Hyman Group in 2015, and then we started Sales Mastery in 2017, 2018. Before that, uh, before Jim and I partnered up in uh, 20, uh, sorry, in 2002, um, I had been president of the Goldmine division of um, Goldmine Software. And that came, you know, maybe I should start at the other end and forget about my civil engineering background, although I have a great sales thing. I may put that in the video one day <laughs> um, about changing the sale. But uh, I started with Miller Hyman like in 1983. And, uh, folks who don't know, uh, strategic selling, conceptual selling, those things have been around. Um, and then I became president of Miller Hyman in, in 1986, then went out on my own, was doing consulting and speaking sales process mapping in the nineties, teamed up with, uh, uh, Joe Vavrica, who also was at Miller Hyman, came from HP idea, and started salesware. So we had a you know, a sales software company in the nineties, we called it pipeline performance metrics. Today they called analytics, but that's what we were doing. And that company was acquired by a uh, gold mine in uh, 2000. So Miller high sales training for nine years, did several hundred programs, um, sales process mapping and software in the nineties got acquired sales research and advisory services and the odds got acquired and around. Yeah, you've been around the block once or twice. Oh, Talking to here, your partners. here are a couple of this. This here, I'll put a plug in for this because this is, you know, that's ancient history. This is current. Uh, Jim and I are, you know, in uh, the November December two thousand twenty two issue of HBR. Um, maybe we can talk about that, or maybe he talked about that, and and that's the second time we were published by them here in the U.S. Plus uh, once over in their Eastern European versions. Well done. You know, we've got some of that. Well, done. by the way, uh, I've only been published once in there is when I wrote the book on AI, the sales ex machina book that, you know, and it was like, wow, you know, it's quite impressive to get it. It's hard to get in there. You got two articles in there. What is it? I did not talk to Jim about this. What is this latest article about? There, there are two things about it I'm very excited about. Um, the title is, can AI really help you sell? And, um, and there are some graphics I can, I can put up and show you, um, the answer is yes, uh, if you use it and know how to use it and have enough data in, you know, educating it to be used. Uh, and, and none of that is intuitively obvious. Well, maybe if you know how to use it, it's obvious. but uh, it takes a lot of data. The good news is that there's a lot of data available. Today. Uh, you know, AI has been around since the fifties, but. We either didn't have the hardware, we didn't have the software, we didn't have the data. Now we have, you know, all three. So that's really working. But the reason I'm excited, Jim's, you know, kind of the AI side of the house, the two things we focus on at Sales Mastery are AI for sales. He's been now studying that for the last seven years. And I'm interested in sales as a profession. You know, what does it mean? Who are we? What are we becoming? What do we want to become? That sort of thing. And that's, that actually is a lead into the thing I'm excited about in the article, we introduced the sales performance scorecard and I've got a couple, uh, graphics I can show you, I can put up here and maybe they can edit them in if you want to do that. But 
Back in 2007, we introduced the sales relationship process matrix, vertical axis, five levels of relationship, horizontal axis, four levels of sales process, and um, collected data on that for 15 years. And it was completely consistent that as you moved up and over in the matrix, things got better. Uh, and, and things like annual plan attainment, percentage of reps, meeting, beating quota, the total rep turnover going down, forecast accuracy going up and so on. I mean, good stuff, the things you measure and count on. Um, we felt that it, the SRP had served us well, and, and now Miller Hyman and, and by extension, Corn Ferry. But we also felt that it needed to be updated to reflect that what everybody has talked about, the change in the balance of power from sellers to buyers and the influence of the internet technology and so on. And so we now have introduced in this article, uh, the sales performance scorecard, again, five levels of relationship on the vertical axis, but we've redefined three of the five. Talk about that if you want. And on the horizontal axis, uh, we've added a fifth level of process, uh, implementation to reflect AI and machine learning. So, so, so on the relationship side, I mean, walk me, walk me through your definition. You say on the vertical axis, we got the relationship, five layers of relationship. Walk me through what that means. I don't know if I understand that. Uh, that's great. Let me pop this up and uh, if you don't mind, I'll. No, no, go right ahead and, we'll, and I'll, we'll talk through it for those who are listening on the podcast. Yeah. So this was the SRP, the sales relationship process matrix. And this is now, um, you know, uh, IP that Corn Ferry acquired. Uh, from us, but we define five levels of relationship. And by the way, on our website and on our YouTube channel, there's a video about levels of relationship. And the reason I did that uh, back in 1994, I defined these five levels because I thought people were too casual about the way they talked about relationships. And you can watch the video about that. But the five levels we defined were approved vendor, preferred supplier, solutions consultant, strategic contributor, and trusted partner. So let me pause there. So I want to make sure people were listening. So the lowest level would be an approved vendor yep. in terms of relationship. Then we moved up to a prefer preferred vendor. Solutions, now we're helping you with more than just a product, trying to put a solution together. Strategic would be the fourth one, which is basically maybe how you would approach the market with what we can offer and what you offer. And then the trusted partner is, you're on the same side of the table, really collaborating on a solution. Fair enough? Yes, what I would, absolutely. Uh, maybe even a little more specifically, and again, they can watch the video, but proved vendors, they have great products and services. And mm -hmm. the sales rep is basically a walking, talking catalog. Right. Um, preferred suppliers, um, you have some track record of delivery, uh, probably starting to get, you know, a network of contacts and so on. Solutions consultant, you understand their business and the customer's customer and how you're going to impact their business. Now you've started moving off your products and services and into their business. Strategic contribute, you have domain expertise. So not just in this industry, but how it relates and where it's going. And trusted partner, very high level of play. You have great insights to both your organization and the buying organization and how to get things done there and sharing, you know, strategic roadmaps. And as you said, sitting on the same side of the table instead of across the table mm -hmm. and helping figure out the plans. Now, a couple of things, I'll just say along those lines, um, down here at Approved Vendor are transactions, rapid, repetitive, routine, mm -hmm. boom, boom, boom. By definition, that's where technology plays. And again, all of this is in the video. Um, you know, you don't, you don't go into a bank anymore and ask a, a teller mm -hmm. what your account levels are. You know, you don't even go to an ATM anymore. You just look it up on your phone. Okay. So the lowest level of approved vendor, uh, is constantly being eroded by technology and there are better things, better selling, higher order selling to do when you move up. The thing I was going to say, um, about and in, in the video, we talk about things that go up as you go up levels of relationship, things that go down. Our research shows about two thirds of uh, all reps are down here in the lower three levels, lowest three levels. About nine or 10% make it up to trusted partner level. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting is as you move up through levels of relationship, one of the things that 
the chain that's on both sides is risk. Okay. So as you move up through levels of relationship, the risk of losing the deal is going down. You with me? Yep. Okay. But the risk of the deal is going up because they're making bigger bets with you. In some cases, they might even be making bet their company bets on you. Right. And so that's why all these other things, trust and credibility and, and track record and so on, all of that's going on. So that's the, and then we had four levels of process, random process. Everybody's doing their own thing. Informal, we have a process. People are exposed to it. They're expected to use it, but we'll monitor that. Formal process, it's just the opposite. It's the way we do business around here. It's kind of our Bible. We do monitor it. We do reinforce it. We do enforce it and dynamic is proactively starting to use things like analytics and other leading indicators and studying the data, becoming more data-driven, leveraging technology and so on. So Here's in my... short, you're at a disadvantage if you're an approved vendor just selling products off the shelf, transactional with a random process, never a winning strategy. The ideal situation is to be a trusted advisor with a dynamic process that adjusts to the actual buyer. We talk about those things in, uh, in the article. So yeah, I agree with you. One of the things is there are people when you're approved vendor and random process, it doesn't mean you're unsuccessful. It means you're unpredictable. And so when, when times are good operating in random fashion, just doing transaction, boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Uh, but when things get quiet, uh, then you're really vulnerable. Okay, so mm -hmm. I'll say it again. It doesn't mean you're unsuccessful. There are a lot of people who've made plenty of money in that space. You're unpredictable, and that means you're vulnerable. And and this these stars here actually, we've been talking to clients, advisory services clients, you know, going into 2023. Everybody seems to agree we're going into hard times, or or at least a recession. Nobody knows how hard or soft the landing will be. We went back and looked at the 2008 Black Swan event, you know, the Great Recession. Uh, folks that were at this level that you were just talking about, if they continued to do the same things in 2009, 2008, 2009, they got crushed. But if they moved up to this level, they basically held steady where they were the year prior. If they were at this level, they continued to do the same things they did. They got crushed. But if they moved up to this level, they, they didn't. Mm -hmm. They basically ran in place. They ran in place. In other words, they didn't lose ground, not doing the same things. They stayed in the same place, but they weren't doing the same things. The ones who did the same things got crushed. And when we say that, we mean they, on average, uh, dropped 12 to 15% and it took two years to come back. So yeah. So, so based on this graph and mm -hmm. you can, you can do the unsharing. I got it. The. When you know when you guys were always putting out data at CSO Insights, you were talking about every year you guys were measuring. I thought this was brilliant. You guys were always measuring what percentage of salespeople were actually hitting their quota. Mm -hmm. And if I look at that graph, and by the way, we'll put a link to the actual graph and where you can see that graph and that video uh, in the description uh, on the podcast. But you know, talk to me, reconcile those two for me. If uh, they they pretty much line up, right? More and more salespeople are not hitting their number. I don't know where the new numbers are at. Maybe you have some new data, but then tie that in with what you just showed me, which is the different types of relationship levels and sales process. The thing that we found, uh, we defined three performance levels uh, with the, you know, the really insightful names, performance level one, two, and three. Hmm. That's quite creative there. Quite creative. We, we <laughs> When we first came out, we had uh, sleepless nights, um, I don't know, somewhat de sleepy. decent years and, and, you know, good future or something, but it would put, we changed performance levels one, two, right. and three. Um, as you move over on the horizontal axis, what you'd start to have is more, more process, more rigor, but you also have as a result of that, because everybody now is kind of playing out of the same, singing out of the same hymn book, playing out of the same playbook, whatever, you now start to have increased collaboration, uh, team learning, team sharing, you start to get more coaching. And then as you move further over and start leveraging technology, the coaching starts being not just my opinion or my instincts, but really looking at data and becoming much more specific about uh, that. So that's on the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis, I talked about the changes, you know, from product to 
to mm -hmm. delivery to so on. But the kinds of things that are happening in a relationship are um, greater access, uh, more introductions, reference right. quality, referrals, fewer competitive bake-offs. One of the things that's interesting as you move up through levels of relationship is the significance of any feature or function of your product is actually decreasing as you go up. That makes sense. And the, that and, makes sense. And, and what is replacing that, and this is the whole deal. I mean, this is kind of why you want to get better at sales. The whole notion of sales mastery is because you're adding value in other ways. Mm -hmm. Okay, that whole notion of value add, Okay, well, the, the customer is going to say what's valuable, but the whole thing they want to know is what's coming. So right. there are a couple, we have a couple of videos on that, you know, calling high uh, parts one and two. And the, the part one, it, the, the subtitle for that is my, my big fat Greek wedding. Mm -hmm. So do you remember that movie? Yep, I do. I what do, do you remember movie. about it? It's, by the way, it's a great movie. But a lot of people who are probably watching or listening to this have said, I don't know what that movie is. Yeah, because it came out like in 2003 or five or so. These, right. Yeah. yeah so a whole know. bunch of people. Never, great movie. It's called My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Really fun. And the, the dad of the bride is this Greek. And basically there are two things throughout. Here's the lesson of the movie. Anything worthwhile was invented by Greeks. Hmm. Everything, he traced everything back to Greece. And any problem could be fixed with, do you remember what you could fix any problem? I do not. I do not. Windex. Pizza? <laughs> Windex. Windex. That was his answer to everything, Windex. Mm. And so guess what? The answer to calling high is Windex. I was going to ask you, so so again, visually so people could see it. If you're moving up on the relationship ladder, right? Yeah. The five levels. Yeah. The highest level being trusted advisor, but you also have to have a dynamic process to adjust. So... Here, here's a conundrum. You, you, we have a lot of new salespeople who are coming into the market, right? New salespeople. They're hiring SDRs, BDRs, whatever they are. They're hiring new salespeople, right? We know that the older folk, can, if I can put it that way, who've been around 10 years or you somewhere in that, that area, way. can probably hit the high sales, right? Get to the trusted advisor level. How do you, as an SDR, BDR, or maybe even as a manager of these folks, help these salespeople actually accelerate those five levels, move away from the transactional to the, the true relationship trusted advisor level. I mean, what are you seeing in the market that helps people just speed to value? How do I get them there faster? You know, my, my favorite definition of a shortcut is the longest distance between two points. Mm -hmm. um, if you've ever taken a shortcut and right. it got totally lost. Right. You know, I think the, the problem with the question, Victor, is how do you do it faster? And it's like, right. you know, way back when there was, their, 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 their ad was no wine before it's time. Mm -hmm. You know, some things just take time and building relationships is one. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, we just met. You want to get married? Right. And, and I think that's kind of what people are expecting BDRs and SDRs to come up with, you know, some secret Heist. Oh, here we go. High velocity sales. That's what we're doing. Right. High velocity right. sales. Let's get there faster. And it's like, right. you know, I don't think that works in relationship. People actually got, this isn't about selling stuff. It's about establishing and elevating relationships over time, you know, earning your, your stripes. Then, you know, I think you just make solid progress and you get there when you get there. So mm -hmm. there are lots of things. I've got tons of it feeling about what the, we should be doing and how we do it. The only problem I have with the question is faster. And I think the, the answer is just make steady progress, you know, be disciplined. Okay, how do we get there more efficiently? Like what can, if I'm a manager and I'm just trying to just, you know, push it, just, I'll, I'll eliminate the word faster since you don't okay. like faster or velocity. Uh, how do I get my people to level up their game, right? Sure. So that they can meet their customer at their level, how do I get them to level up? Okay, so besides go to salesmastery.com and enjoy all the programs and all the programs and right. all of which are free, by the way. Right. One, uh, I'll just back it up. Let me start with some research, since you know one mm -hmm. of our favorite quotes is from Deming. You know, without data, you're just another guy with an opinion. 
uh, I think it was, was it Barksdale? Somebody said, if we're going to, if you have data, let's talk about the data. If you only have opinions, let's use my opinion. Correct. The, the, the data in the report that we just issued in October, the sales performance scorecard study, um, the, the, the winning combination was, uh, process people having basic sales training and being trained on the technology that they were supposed to be using. Mm -hmm. I mean, that yep. seems pretty basic, right? And one of the things, you know, we talked before we started the recording, but you know, you just have to do the work. You got to do the work. That's my message. And the problem, Anthony, with what you're asking is, I think many reps today have not actually been trained to know what doing the work means. So, you know, back in the seventies and eighties, IBM had, uh, you know, sales offices with, it wasn't, and you could have 500 sales reps in an office mm -hmm. and, you know, people standing around the water cooler and people were trained IBM. ADP, Pitney Bowes, Xerox, they trained America's sales force and people right. went through training, Xerox learning systems, all that stuff. Tulip Packard, you know, was a huge uh, client, Miller Hyman. People, you know, got trained. They were there with their, with their colleagues. They went back to the office. They worked together. If, you know, this happened more than once where a rep would at Xerox would come back and say, man, I got stripped on this call today. I went in and. and some veterans say, well, what's the problem? Well, here's what the guy asked me and you know, I didn't have any. And they would say, well, okay, two things. Number one, here's what I say when people, you know, ask me that kind of question. Here's my answer. But here's, here's the same. Let's go back there tomorrow. I'll go with you. And we'll talk right. to that guy together. Right. You know, and they'd make four-legged sales call. That's not happening as much today either, you know, because people are working remotely and, you know, different right. hours and so on. So I think... Number one, I'm not sure people are really getting all the training. You know, we're, we're trying to do micro training now an LMS and everybody's, you know, self-paced and, and I get that people learn at their own speed, mm -hmm. but you know, I think having that basic foundation and, and some consistency around that, and then having that baked into the process. So we are using the vocabulary, the technology mm -hmm. is, you know, providing data and so on. Those are the things that are missing. You know, typically it's either not baked in or it's become a checkbox or people don't use a vocabulary. So there's all of that. The well, other I, thing I'll like say, because you, 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 you've actually, I mean, you, there, there's a lot of stuff in what you just said. One is that, you know, we can use technology, right? To train people. I know you don't like the word faster, but we get to train them more often because, because the technology is ubiquitous, right? Now I can take my phone. If I got some like, I don't know, rehearsing a script, right? I can watch it, then record it, listen back. So I have the technology I didn't have back then. Right. But you point out, uh, again, several things indirectly that are very important. One is a lot of people think training is a one-off thing. As you say, it's, it's a process and it's consistent, right, over time. You talked about role play. There's another thing that, again, is lacking. I would think we can leverage technology to do some of that. Let me just uh, talk about that for just one second. Sure. You've got notes there. Let's just talk about role play did a lot of, um, sales training back in the day. And whenever it come to role playing, there'd be veterans that are going to come on, you know, this isn't real, you know, this, this isn't how I roll, right. and, you know, it's artificial and all that stuff. But sales mastery is not just our title. It's a, you know, a pursuit of mine for the last 40 years. And, uh, there are five keys to mastery and, you know, having a coach surrender practice the edge and your excitement. And, um, this notion of the edge is here's one way to absolutely recognize masters who've got all this track record and experience mm -hmm. is their willingness to look foolish in front of their peers. And so when, when I would be doing a class and it's like, okay, we're going to do a role play. If, if a senior, you know, like a key account manager, goes, I'll start, I'm in. You know, they're not afraid. They're not sitting back, arms crossed, you know, right. leaning back yep. in their chair. You know, I've done it all. I've seen it. Like they're in, you know, can I improve? Is there some place for me to improve here? The best are always looking to get better and they're willing to look foolish doing it. Yep. And that's, that's, that's a key attribute of people who are willing to get better. A lot of the things I was going to say is, you know, 
the, the question is always, well, did I make my number? Did I make my number? Here's what people need to know about the num about quota. Quota is the company's best guess at an account or a territory's potential. Correct. The quota well, is yes. the company's best guess at an account or a territory's potential, but it has nothing to do with your potential. Correct. So lots of people say, Hey, I was a hundred percent of plan. I was 120% of plan, 200% of plan. I have never had anybody say I'm 150% of my potential. Right. Two different things. Two totally different things. And, and if we, I think the big lie is in, when I presented this early nineties at Oracle, the whole room exploded in laughter, which was, I said, you are not your number. Mm -hmm. And everybody just went crazy. Of course I might know. That's the big lie. The big lie is you are your number. Good number, good I number, bad number, no donut. It's like, that's crap. Okay. Your that's number <laughs> is a reflection of what you do and how well you do it. Period. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, you know, but that's your result. It's not you. It's, you're not your cool car, you're not your cool house, you're not your cool designer glasses. Take mm -hmm. all that stuff away, you're still here, man. Yeah, I got you. The, I want to ask, by the way, you also mentioned like role playing. You kind of talked about that, which I think is important. Now, one of the things I see when, when well, I- Well, it's about companies, practicing. I, I asked the VP of sales, where do, your, where do your reps practice? He, he thought about it, he goes, in front of our customers. I said, that's right. He goes, the oh my God, we're playing with live ammo. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's like, the what, what I find interesting is that, and, and by the way, I, I see that a lot. People practice on their clients, never a good thing. What about the, the the fact that a lot of companies say they have a sales process, but they really don't? Do you have any data around, like, how many companies actually have a sales process? Have you guys ever done, like, a survey? Like, who has a sales process? I mean, by the way, let me, let me qualify it. A documented repeatable, duplicatable, ubiquitous sales process. That's what I mean by a process. Yeah, the number that they're consistently referring to. And, uh, you know, the numbers are quite low. I mean, I would say uh, companies, uh, you know, 85% of companies have CRM. Mm -hmm. Okay, probably, you know, 80% of those have some sort of process. Uh, in their OMS, you know, so that they can track opportunities to moving along. Uh, in terms of consistently, um, I, I don't want to just say referring to, but consistently uh, reinforcing and enforcing, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's probably 20% or less. Yeah, I'll go say somewhere down there. Yeah, or, or I less. I mean, if you start also looking at, you know, the data, and incorporating that into coaching, I would say it's less than 10%. Yeah, lip, lip. I was gonna say 15% for sales process. Yeah. When, you, when you see these, and again, we, you, you mentioned certain things people can do to you know, level up faster, right? And that is to you know, do the role playing, do, you know, don't practice on your clients, practice, use the technology to find ways to actually you know, absorb it. Because I think part of it is, let me give you, here's a different tag. I, this is what I've been wondering about, Barry, and, and maybe you can kind of maybe give you your angle. The way we teach sales, the way we teach sales, and I'll give you a background, a quick background. I'm reading a book about how people learn, how, pe how we absorb information, and then how we retain information. And study after study is showing that repeating, rereading something doesn't help retention, right? It just doesn't, right? But yet we keep doing it. We think that giving a people a quiz after they've studied something will increase retention. Studies showed after a month, a lot of that stuff is just pretty much dissipated. And so, what do you see? What do we need to do different? For, and maybe we've answered this question already, but I think there's more to to this. Well, there's a lot of that's shit for you, kid. Yeah. And so, I mean, how well, do we... Well, it starts with a... Here's a basic question, Victor. Okay. How do you know... You're talking about training, but it's about people learning and growing. Okay. Correct. So the most fundamental question you can ask is, how, how do you know that learning has occurred? Correct. How do you know? I'm asking. Uh... I don't know, because I, I can't test for it. Yeah, you know what I mean. You can't. Quizzes don't prove. 
You want yeah, to let you know learning has taken place? And so, by the way, it's a very good question, actually, because how do you know that a learning has occurred? You, I'll tell you it, how. How? Behavior changes. Modifications, right. That's how you that. know something has been learned, because they change right. what they're doing. Right. So or at least how it, do you... Yes, yes. I'm, I'm processing what you're saying because you're right. And also, even, even behavior could be in the form of even the questions that they're asking their clients, for Especially example. Especially the questions they're asking yeah. and yeah, the order in which they things. ask them. That's correct. That, that is a good way of putting it. The, but, but, but I think there's a deeper question. that I, I, I was looking at it from a different perspective. Okay. How do I know that learning has occurred, right? You can say, well, I can watch the behavior, right? And if the behaviors aren't there, I can actually conclude that no learning had occurred, right? But how do I know that they did learn it, but then rejected it and decided not to do it? That's where my brain went. I go, well, that's a kind of a trick question because I could have learned it, but then decided not to use it because I still feel my approach is better. Okay, so then the behavior didn't change. Right, the behavior didn't change. I learned it, but learning did occur. I learned it, but I didn't change my behavior. I'm, I'm, I'm splitting hairs here, yeah. but you and I have seen that we can show people, look, this works. You understand? Yes, I understand it, but still say, I don't want to do it that way. And as, right. as we're moving into this new year, winds of recessions are coming our way, right? That's what people were saying, which means that now I, I've talked to companies, you give me your perspective, they're telling me, look, leads are drying up. Leads are drying up. They're, they're not falling out of the sky like manna from heaven anymore. So now they're working harder to kind of get new clients. But something has happened, Barry, is that these salespeople who have it good for the last two years, I'll, I'll say their sales muscles have atrophied. And so what do they do now? And so, so what's your perspective moving into the new year on what salespeople or maybe managers should be working with their salespeople on to kind of get them going again? Well, for sure. I mean, I, I, you have to do the work. And what, what does that mean? I saw a poster years, decades ago, and it showed basically, you know, we used to call it a bum, you know, sitting on a park bench, you know, all crummy long beard, you know, stub of a cigarette. And, and the caption was selling is like shaving. If you don't do it every day, you look like a bum. Right. And I think, you know, when you talk about sellers who is, you know, selling muscle at atrophy, uh, you know, I think it comes from whatever you want to call it, coasting, resting on your laurels, having made your book, made your bones. And now, you know, you can, you know, rely on that, you know, the number one objective is still new logos and, and new business. So the people who are in strategic or key accounts, you know, are they penetrating adjacent business units? You know, are they upselling and cross-selling all of that stuff? And the numbers mm -hmm. are still remarkably low on that stuff, but more importantly, we have a, a video on this and call it the easiest sale. And when you talk about BDRs and SDRs, we talked about this before. I think I'm going to relabel this, you know, why SDRs and BDRs are getting chewed up like sawdust. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's terrible what, what's happening to all these new entrants. And, and basically this is, you know, BDRs and SDRs are like the entry point. Many of these folks are, you know, their first job out of college and that welcome to sales, welcome to the wonderful world of sales. Let's just see how many of you can make it. You know, it's throwing them in the deep end of the pool and people say, well, sink or swim, the strong will make it. But come on, man, there's so much more available if people get a decent start, you know, and, and sales is just an awesome career. If you don't get washed out in the first eight months, you know, I mean, it's just crazy. In any event, um, I think if you looked at some of those veterans and, you know, the example I gave before of, you know, here, I'll go with you tomorrow. What if we brought one or two newbies into these key accounts and said, here's some, here's some basic relationship maintenance work that you should start doing and I'll oversee it. It's my account, but we're going to be sharing it. And the cycles they're then freeing up will free this veteran to either call higher, broader, deeper in the account, or go start working on breaking in a new account, you know, creating a new logo. And, you know, I don't see people willing to do that on either side. 
they just keep throwing the, the new hires at, at the hardest sale. You know, the other thing that I think, uh, I mean, you know, we don't have time for this and I'm not expert in it, but you know, when you, when you look at multi-generational sales forces, you know, it's like, here's the comp plan, right? And you know, uh, somebody who's 62 years old, their kids are, you know, either in or out of college, you know, they probably have a lot of their stuff paid for and are figuring out, do they want to take social security at 65 or at 70 or 72? You know, that's a very different thing than somebody who's just gotten out of college or who been out of college for five years, starting a family has two small kids and, and, you know, trying to buy a house. And it's like, well, here's a comp plan. Mm -hmm. It's like, really? That's the best we've got is, you know, if you want to, if you want to keep in sales, here's the deal. It's like, I think there's just an unbelievably huge opportunity to engage people and tailor, you know, the, I, I think the, the new generation, they're saying, you know, we want meaningful work. We want purpose driven work. Uh, sure. we want work-life balance. I, I think they're on the right track. And I think we could be a lot more creative with everybody on that scale. Doesn't just have to be Gen Z and millennials. I think everybody wants, you know, a great life and to, you know, to get better. Yeah. You remind me of Daniel Pink's book, Drive, mm -hmm. where he talked about, you know, beyond the money, the compensation piece, he said they want three things. People want autonomy, mastery, growth, and then purpose. Mm -hmm. If you can kind of do a Venn diagram of those three and find it right in the middle, that's what motivates people. That's what increases loyalty, which is kind of not what you see today. Uh, something that when I was talking to, to, to Jim, uh, Jim Dickey, your partner, was he talked about uh, when people were, you know, back in 2008, 2009, I know it seems like a long time ago, but we seem like be repeating this again, of what might be happening, that the people who did survive the first round of cuts stayed. But the, the managers didn't ask the question, are they staying the way Jim phrased it was? Are they staying because they want to stay or are they staying in spite of the fact that we're doing certain things to them that they probably don't agree with? Right. And they found out their answer when the economy started turning and people started bailing. Yeah. You course. know, what's your take on that? Well, I, yeah, I think we, we call it the T-Rex syndrome. You know, the people that are, if they don't move, they won't get eaten. You know, they will get shot. Um, right. I think that... Um, You know, this goes back to your earlier question as well. You know, I think it's about consistency. And, you know, if you're, if you're looking out for your people, if you're growing and coaching your folks and supporting them, you know, with tools and training for their success, you know, I think people are going to stick around, you know, they want to know I've got a, I've got a decent shot at making, you know, making plan here and I think what often happens, you know, when there are layoffs, it's hard to know who to feel sorry or for the people who were laid off or the people who are sticking around, you know, because <laughs> uh, well, the, the work didn't go away. That's what it, and I, I, I wanted to ask you this question before I forget, because I, it, it really wraps up this, you know, it ties coaching technology. You know, when you look at all these companies, they just keep throwing technology at this problem, right? And let's just say it's coaching, right? And, you know, I don't know how many, you know, when you look at people's, a company's tech stack, I don't know how big they're getting, but they, it feels like a Jenga thing going on, you know, yeah. just keep drawing. What's your take on throwing technology at, let's say, performance and coaching? Well, you know, I think uh, there have been so many analogies between sports and sales, but I think in this case, it's wholly appropriate. It, let's say you were a high school track coach and... Uh, your, your team just keeps coming in last. I mean, if you don't have any data, you're basically relegated to cheerleading. You know, it's like, try harder, run faster. Hey, oh, I'm running my heart out. By the way, that's a, that's like 80% of the companies, if we could use a Pareto principle, try harder. I have no data, but try harder. You can yeah. do it, man. And, and, you know, the thing we say, and, and by the way, we're recording this, in uh, mid December and, and people are beginning, you know, starting their new year and in a few weeks. And it's like, well, I don't have a late number yet. It, it, a lot of times you have people who get their number till late February, early March. It's like, here, here's what we can tell you. It will be higher. 
Yeah. It's a, it's oh, anti- quotas are anti-gravity, aren't they? They always go up. They never come down. And and so our analogy is, let's say you're a high school track coach, and, and you were asking about the percentage, the highest percentage we've seen of reps making their number is 62%. And we've seen it fall below 50 so that's, mm. that's basically the range. And most comp plans are designed with 55% of reps, you know, making them. Interesting. Um, they, they don't plan for a hundred percent making the number. I mean, that's just not the way comp plans are set up. In any event, um, if, if 55% or 62% of your kids on your track team are clearing the high jump at five, five. And you don't change anything. How many do you think are going to clear the bar at five, six or five, seven? Yeah. It's no, going to go higher. Well, if no more people making it will go. If 55% cleared five, five, some right. number lower than 55% is correct. going to close, clear five, seven. I mean, come on. So we're throwing two things at people. We throw, we throw technology at people to try to solve the problem. We throw, we try to change the compensation, right? Bigger carrot yeah. or a, a prettier carrot. Yeah. So what else is left in the toolbox of managers? You know, it, use the tools. Okay, so here's the deal. And if you go back to the sport, if you look at like, let's take the Olympics, you know, if you took the 100 meter sprint, they have, you know, they have sensors on the, on the shoe pads to know how much pressure you're putting on. And they they videotape and time these things that you peaked and they got heart monitors and all this stuff. It's like you peaked too early, you peaked too late, you came up too high too soon, you didn't come up high enough at the end. I mean, you know, there right. there's all this data in there and that's why you keep seeing the performance better and better and better. If you want to have some fun, you know, I'm kind of a car guy, if, if you've seen the Netflix series Drive to Survive, no. oh, man. All right. It's about Formula One. Okay. And it, it's just killer. I wrote an article, uh, gosh, a few, a few years ago, and I'm pretty sure I'm remembering this correctly. It was unbelievable to me at the time. To gain a tenth of a second on a lap in Formula One cost $100 million. Hmm. That's how, that, that's how precise and, and high performing. Yeah. So the thing that I've always said is in a highly competitive, highly professional, high payoff environment, it's not, you know, gee, if we were two seconds faster, we'd be winning. If you're two right. seconds slower, you've been a line, man. Gotcha. You're not on the podium. Yeah. So when you look at, let's use that same, let's go with that analogy because I like that analogy. So sales managers should be bringing more data to the table to talk to their salespeople and say, here's what's going on. You're not, you're not, I don't know, you're not changing your, 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 the tire fast enough in the pit stop. You need a more, a high torque RPM type of drill to kind of get those nuts off faster, whatever. They need basically some understanding as to what they're not doing correctly. So is it safe to say that the managers, one, A, may not have the data, or if they have the data, they don't know how to deliver the message? People are drowning in data. They're dying of thirst for insight in actionable information. I got all the data. I got data coming out of my ears. I don't know what it even means. Right. So where's where's the missing link here? If the data is there, the reservoir data is there from the company, here's the manager. Why can't we bridge the two? Because because people aren't using it or it's not, you know, one of the things, one of the, you talked about Tim Reister early, you know, what confidence do CSOs have in their CRM date? Uh, not very high. Not very high. Not very high. So, not very high. You know, they're all made up numbers and not great because we are being consistent in how the stuff gets entered, how mm-hmm. it, how it's, you know, if, if you're actually using this stuff, it gets better over time. If you say, well, wow, this doesn't seem to be, you know, connecting. So. So number one, people have tons of data. They have no actionable information because nobody or no thing is looking at. Right. When they do, you start getting bar charts and all this stuff. One of my best tips in our, in our report was do not let any of your managers or reps report to you in PowerPoint or Excel. Hmm. Make them use the tool. Right. Here, here are the three gauges I look at. Here's the page that opens every day that tells me what to do. Here's here, you know, 
Here's how That's I use point. this thing. Great point. Yeah, because yeah. otherwise, you know, they're not. And, that is you know, you've got good people, you've got good tools, you've got good products. How come Johnny can't sell? And it's like, well, because, you know, we're sort of not using them. One of our analogies was, um, you know, you've got, you know, these sales organizations with all this technology, all this training, all these great people. And it's like, you know, a BMW M1 and a Ferrari and a Porsche GTS all driving down the, the Autobahn because they have no data. They're like, well, I'm cool. I'm cool. You know, nobody's running away from me. They're going like 70 miles an hour. <laughs> right. And it's it like, be, these things could be a quick show an faster. hour. And, and we're just kind of cruising along because, hey, nobody's getting away. I, I'm good. I'm all good here. It's like, Average is good. So, so your company, Sales Mastery, what you guys do is, you and Jim, you actually go in there and look at a company. And basically, you know, one of the things I, I understand as far as what you do is you're not in there taking sides. Right. You're going in there trying to be agnostic, look at the data, analyze it objectively, then present that to management and said, all right, here's where the chinks in the armor are at. Talk to me about that process, how you work with companies to get to that data. And then how do you present that data? We tr changed a few titles here. So now instead of approved vendor, it's transactional vendor, because we think that's a, a more accurate representation of what's actually happening today. I agree with that one. I, supplier yeah. solution consultant, those haven't changed, but we then changed this to strategic collaborator. And to your point, same side of the table, trusted co-creator. Um, and then on process, we have ad hoc, informal and formal, which is not a big change, but we changed dynamic to agile because people have data, they're using technology, they're able to anticipate um, and are doing a better job being proactive and then customized, which reflects, uh, mm -hmm. you know, increased, uh, use of AI and machine learning. So, um, just to put those in front of folks and we have, uh, this year we started collecting data on this. So we have data from 850 companies on this. And then of course, you know, looking back over time, we know what the patterns were uh, formerly with the, with the matrix. What we're doing now, the offer we have for folks is we have a survey, we survey the sellers and we survey the sales managers and leadership mm -hmm. and look at where the gaps are and look where the alignment is, which is, you know, great, but that's nothing new about that. Anybody could do right. that. In fact, we say if, if you want to do it yourself, you know, DIY, we'll, we'll provide the survey for it. <laughs> sure. You don't have to make it up, but you have a full-time job. You don't have thousands of data points, you know, you're limited to your own experience. What we then can do is not only show where the alignment is and where the gaps are, but we can also talk about the size of the prize for addressing these things, because we have the data and how the performance changes when these things improve mm -hmm. and what the cost of doing nothing or the cost of not changing is. I love that. Because right now people think they're not writing checks. They're writing checks. They just aren't looking at them because they've been writing them for a long time, you know, and you say, well, this is going to cost a hundred thousand bucks. So they go, you know, we don't have that in the budget, but they're already spending 200,000 bucks a month on something that's not working. So, so we do the survey, gather the data, do our analysis, come up with our recommendations, present all that. And the, the thing that you were saying, you know, we don't take sides. We're completely agnostic because the things we're going to recommend, we don't do, you know, we don't do uh comp. We don't do training. We don't do technology. We don't have a dog in the fight or a horse in the race. We just, you know, look at the data and, you know, cause we've got over 60 years of experience between us. We can offer a couple of perspectives at plus, you know, thousands of data points. So that's what we do. So when you present the data to the customers and like, what's the next step? Let's say I like what you've showed me, you know, what is typically the next step for a customer? So you've gone in there, we'll call it a survey, audit, whatever. Sure. Here's our, our assessment, our analysis of what we found. Here's the gaps of where you need to be or need to work on or focus in on. And then what happens is you just give them a roadmap. Do they come to you? Do they, you know, what do they do? We can do either. One company we worked with, a very large software company, when we presented it, the CEO said, yeah, that's all very interesting, but I know what they need. And it's like, okay, then what's that? And it's like, uh, they just need to sell hard. Like, 
Sounds like you have it. Try covered. harder. Try harder. Sounds like you have it covered. And uh, yeah. their sales enablement people, we said, you know, you don't need us if you, you know, if that's the answer. Yeah. And uh, actually, we hadn't done we hadn't done the survey. They called us in because you know uh, we had been referred it, and and we said we don't need. And they called us back a year later. They said, yeah, that didn't work. And so then we did the survey. We presented mm -hmm. the data, and uh, and then the this CEO didn't buy into it. So now we've learned. Yeah. Uh, you know, you need when we say leadership, you need the leadership to say we're we're interested in knowing what we need to change and, and how, and then, how much, you know, coming I, I, up with some order of priority, if it, if, if it turned out they needed technology, we don't provide technology, but we know a lot of folks, you know, we're constantly interviewing and getting briefings as analysts. And so we can introduce them to firms. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you know, we don't charge for that. It, it's all part right. of this deal. And if they want us to stick around and evaluate things, you know, we, we certainly have done that. We have advisory services, but. Yeah, I was, I was always wondering, are they, are they often shocked or surprised by how much you said they're not writing the checks, but they're really writing the checks with their own inaction, right? By doing the things they've always done the same way. Have you ever like, you know, when you presented these losses to them, these, you know, here's what you're losing out on. Here's what you're leaving on the table. You know, how sizable have these, you know, uh, losses been? I mean, what's, Give me, a, give me an example of a client. We presented this, Victor, and they're like, holy buckets. I didn't realize we were losing this much. I think it's, you know, the, the frog in the pot of water that, you know, you mm -hmm. turn the heat up slowly and they just adjust to it, mm -hmm. I think. Um, I, I think the two things that are really sort of astonishing for folks is when, when they actually see the numbers because, you know, they, they – I, I would say that most CSOs are, are operating on, on the basis of, you know, intuition or instinct. And their instinct is we're not firing on all cylinders, but I think we're doing okay. Right. You know, and they're judging that based on, you know, certainly thinking about the supercars on the Autobahn, you know, nobody's running away from me. So, I'm, you know, I think we're competitive, um, but they really don't have data. And when, yeah. when uh, do you challenge them? I, I just want to know, do you challenge them though? Like when you're in the meeting and it says, well, I, I think we're doing fine. Well, how do you know you're doing fine? Yeah. How do you I know? Said, how do you document fine? How do you measure what yeah. is success you push, look I mean, like? I want to know, Chip. I mean, uh, uh, Barry, do you push, push them back on their heels? Well, tell me what you mean by you're doing fine. How do you know you? Cause I would be like, in, you don't want me in the room with you. Cause I would be, I, I'd be running. I'd be crawling over the table just trying to get to him and says, really, you're doing fine. How do you know you're doing fine? Because your gut tells you? Is your so gut you, been right I'm a West you Coast guy. You? You're, you're an East Coast guy. You're doing fine? You think yeah, you're so, doing fine? <laughs> <laughs> you're yeah. I mean, I'm, not that, I'm Midwest, but I, I, I put a little softness on it. But I would be pushing back like, how do you know you're doing fine? Why well, I feel it. How'd you do last year? Not so good. So you're not doing fine. Something's yeah. missing, right? This is why we're here. Actually, this is why sales the, the, here. The, the question we most often ask when we get that, you know, fine. Don't get me started. Jim. We always ask. Started, Barry. We always ask the Doctor Phil question. So how's that working for you? How's that working for you? You know, why are we even yeah. here? Why are we talking about? Because yeah. it's not fine. Everybody knows yeah. it's not fine. And now, do they usually call you in? We we're often so you know it, we're introduced in a lot of different ways. Uh, mm. We have had clients who found us through our research. Uh, mm. and we had a you know terrific client, this, the CSO was a, was a real data guy and he was out doing research and found us and, uh, we yeah. had, you know, delightful relationship with him for years. Uh, we're often introduced, uh, to companies. We are, um, with Accenture, they have a, a program called their luminaries and they're mostly ex CEOs and CFOs, CIOs, a lot of academics, mm -hmm. Robert Fuller, you know, from hey, Harvard's part of it. So there are about 50 of them globally right now. And, and, and Jim and I are the only two luminaries mm -hmm. that for sales. Yeah. I think, I think next time you go in there, someone says we're doing fine. I really want you to say, no, you're not. That's what they all say. No, you're not. <laughs> just, just stare them down. No, you're not. No, you're not doing fine. That's what they all tell me. That's why I'm here. That's what well, I can say. tell you the thing that when, when, when I've been in, presenting in meetings, we, you know, we kind of get to that place and they say, I just don't buy them. That's, that's what 
what I've heard before. Oh, I love they're, that. What do you say? What do you say to that one? And they say, okay, well, uh, but in our most recent thing that I'm quoting from, we have 500 data points, uh, supporting what I'm saying in, in you have how many, you have, what? how many, you have, you go, how many, what, how one? many data points do you have? You have yeah. one. What? That's oh, you, that's yeah, you, you're the, I said, so you're, you're the, not, yeah. not and so that's, that's typically been my response is, you know, yeah, yeah. I, you no, know, I'm yeah. not here to argue my opinion yeah. with you because, you know, go back, yeah. everybody's got an opinion, but sure. you know, but I mean, it's, it's one of those things I get, you know, I, 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 I feel you, Barry, I feel you. You want to come over the table, but you want to be a gentleman about it. See, you're just a much better person than I am. Oh, yeah. All right, Barry, let's begin to wrap this thing up. Let these folks know here at the Sales Influence Podcast you where know, they can find out more information about you. Go ahead. Okay. I was gonna, <laughs> well, we we're, keep talking about it. I got, the, I got in a big fight with a VP. I remember we were standing outside of the elevator lobby, and he was yelling. And, and I was saying, you know, this thing about uh, McKinsey did a study way back when found 80% of people on the job did not know what they were supposed to be doing. And, and I think this is pro, I think this is profoundly played out, not in sales, which I think it is, but even more so for first line sales managers. And so they're either doing what was done to them, which we call victims of victims or what the people in the same role alongside of them are doing, you know, like copying what some guy in the gym is doing. Cause he looks like he's in gym. He knows what he's doing or what they swore they'd ever do different if they got this job. That's how most people are doing their work today is either repeating what was done to them, doing what they're doing, or doing what I think should have been done because none of those things ever work. Okay. But, you know, very little actually what's important. How do I do my job? What's the cadence? How do I know? And so on. if, if 80% of the people don't know how they're doing this is what, where I got in an argument with, uh, this VP, Evan. I said, in sales, 90% of people don't know how they're doing. Well, that's bullshit. I said, no, it's not. He goes, absolutely is. He said, in sales, you always know how you're doing. And I said, let's hear it. He goes, back. What are you, stupid? I'm like, let's hear it. He goes, I'm 60% of plan. I'm doing bad. I'm 120% of plan. I'm doing good. And I said, is, you get it? And I what? <laughs> Okay, I, mean, I get it, but it's not the answer to the question. Okay, the question is, Victor, how are you doing? 60% of plan, 120% of plan. That's not how you're doing. That's how you've done so far. Right. You know, That's my performance, again, not me. History, how are you doing? And right. real question that everybody really wants the answer to, which is, you know, like the big grand prize here is how are you going to do? You know, the forecast, how are you going to do? That's what everybody really wants to know. And in most cases, there's no clue. That's why we say forecast accuracy is an oxymoron. I mean, it's just a joke. The scrap rate's unbelievable. So, you know, I think people having tools, great, ubiquitous, great, expectations, great, but let's, you know, you know there's a process. We have all this stuff, we're just not using it. And when we do use it, we don't get any feedback. So. We have it. We, we don't know how to use it. We use it. We don't know how it's going. If it's not going the way it's supposed to, we're actually getting feedback. Is it a systems problem or a training problem? A system, you know, a training problem is I ask you to do something you're not doing. It's not working. It's like, I hold a gun to your head. You say, I don't know how to do it. That's a training problem. If I say it's not working and, and I hold a gun to your head, you know what? Just do me a favor, just shoot. It's like, I don't know how to do that as a training problem. It's like, if you want me to do this, or do you want me to do this? You tell me what's this month special. I'll do it. That's not a training problem. That's a system problem. And the final piece is we have a video on this. Uh, it's got some terrible name. I'm going to have you rename all of our videos. The, the, the final thing is what are the rewards and consequences? What good, bad happens if I do it? What good, bad happens if I don't do it? And typically the answer is nothing, nothing. Okay. So, uh, you want to know who's using CRM people where it's a condition of your employment. You, you don't want to use it. That's fine, but not here. 
you can't do that here. I use it. Nobody gives me anything back, you know? So I just keep putting in phony numbers because it's easy. I just copy, be good, good. Because nobody's looking at it. Well, nobody's using the data. Nobody's using the data. And I'm sure when you do your audits, you, you find things like this. I'm, I'm sure you go, you're finding all these things when you go in there. So again, Barry, let them know where they can find out more information about you and where they can connect with you. You know, Jim and I are both on LinkedIn. Uh, we've got all our contact info in there. So that's an easy place to connect. Our, our website, obviously, salesmastery.com has a contact uh, point there. Um, you know, love to hear from folks. We have stuff out on YouTube that people want to subscribe to our channel, sales school two dot. You know, we feel that sales has been very, very good to us. And, you know, we're trying to pay it back and pay it forward and, and keep pushing the, and, and doing that in a thoughtful and, and data driven way. And, and the good news is, you know, we're still on the field. We're having fun with it. I love it. Data rules, man. Data rules. On that note, that is it for the Sales Influence Podcast. Leave me some feedback on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Pandora, Twitch, wherever you find us. Leave me some feedback. Love to hear what you have to say. After you do that, go to salesmastery.com. Connect with my man, Barry. Check out the videos on his website over at Sales School 2.0 on YouTube. And last but not least, uh, we've just got some new courses on the Sales Velocity Academy. Check those out. And on that note, this is Victor Antonio always reminding you that selling ain't hard when you have the data and you know how to use it and you know how to implement it. Take care. Big Tin Can is the world's leading sales learning and enablement platform that delivers the onboarding and training, preparation, coaching, customer engagement, and follow-up and insights that modern businesses need to win. 